Hello. Please turn in your Bible with me to Mark chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. That will be our passage this evening. If you're using one of the Bibles provided in the seat in front of you, that will be on page 837. Mark 2, verses 13 to 17. And as you turn there, uh, we, my wife and I count it a great joy to be among you. We count many of you as dear friends, including, as Steve said, Steve and Jen. They've been a massive impact by God's grace in our lives. And a little known fact is that actually my wife and I got married here about six and a half years ago in this building. Everyone was turned facing the opposite direction. It was, it was going that way. And uh, we wanted a place. Our own church building at River City Grace could not hold enough people. And we wanted a place where we, if we were going to pay some church some money to use their facilities, we wanted to make sure it was a church that was a true partner in the gospel. We didn't want to give, there are a lot of churches that have beautiful buildings, but we didn't want to give them any money because they're going to undermine the gospel. And so IBC fit the bill there. We didn't, I don't remember how much money we paid. It wasn't very much. But let me tell you, it was worth every penny because marriage has been awesome. So <laughs> that'll always be a great memory we have about this church. So let me read our passage in Mark 2, 13 to 17 and pray. Seek the Lord's blessing. This is Jesus in verse 13. He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And and as he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Let's pray once more. Father, we know, as you've said, that your word is the imperishable seed that gives new life. Everyone here who has come to be born again by your spirit has been worked upon supernaturally by your word. And we know it's also the powerful tool you use as the milk to nourish us spiritually, to grow us up in maturity in Christ. And so we seek you, we seek your grace and your power at work in our midst through your word tonight. May your spirit be with us in power that you would work your purposes that you intend to give spiritual life to nourish spiritual life, all for your glory in Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. My dad is a deputy district attorney, a prosecuting attorney, and he has up a poster on the wall of his office from the movie Tombstone. This is a bit of an old movie now, but it's a movie about uh, the Old West, and it's a story of Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday, and the, the poster has this picture of four men walking shoulder to shoulder, and they're wearing these long black coats, and they are armed to the teeth. They've got shotguns and pistols and everything, and they look totally mean and scary. And above them, it's just written, justice is coming. Justice is coming. Now, that scene in the movie that the photo comes from is where they're headed to the OK Corral, and you've probably heard of the shootout at the OK Corral. They were there to confront some notorious violent criminals uh, I guess it's loosely based on the true story. And there turned out there was a, an epic shootout and it was all kinds of mayhem. But there is this intimidating, even terrifying edge to justice, isn't there? And when justice truly is coming, it really forces us to ask ourselves a question, who's ready for justice to come? Who's safe when justice comes? There is a frightening, terrifying edge when justice truly comes. And God speaks about this in many places throughout the Bible. In the Old Testament prophets especially, there are many uh, prophecies given about what it's like when God comes in justice. Isaiah 33, verses 14 to 17, God speaks through Isaiah on his coming kingdom to Jerusalem, which is what he means by Zion. He says, The sinners in Zion are afraid. Trembling has seized the godless. And this is what they say, the godless, the sinners. Who among us can dwell with the consuming fire? Who among us can dwell with everlasting burnings? And here's God's answer. He who walks up righteously and speaks uprightly, 
who despises the gain of oppressions, who shakes his hands lest they hold a bribe, who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed and shuts his eyes from looking on evil. Your eyes will behold the king in his beauty. So justice, God's justice is the king coming to burn up sinners with a consuming fire. So with that as our backdrop, let's fast forward seven centuries to to Mark, where we meet Jesus. And in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus, we we were introduced to him in his public ministry in chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, where he proclaims about himself. It says that he uh, is proclaiming the Gospel of God and saying, the kingdom is fulfilled, I'm sorry, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So this is the banner flying over Jesus' ministry, this this first introduction to him that we see many places after that where he's teaching, and we ought to understand that his teaching is basically uh, centered around this proclamation that the time has come, it's fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe. So he's, he's preaching the coming of the kingdom, and especially himself as that king. And that teaching will get fleshed out more as the book of Mark goes on, more explicitly what that teaching looked like. But we might think, because here is Jesus the King, our passage in in verses 13 and 17 is the first time that we see Jesus interacting with very sinful people, with bad folks, as we're going to see in a moment. And we might think, in light of the Old Testament expectation, all right, if he is the King, here it is. It's time for divine wrath to burn. It's time for the wicked to finally get their due and for the just, for the faithful to to God's law to be vindicated. But surprisingly, that is not what we find in this passage. We find something very different when Jesus, King Jesus, mixes with sinners. And specifically, what we will see is that King Jesus came to call self-acknowledged sinners, not the self-made righteous. King Jesus came to call into his kingdom self-acknowledged sinners, not the self-made righteous. And we will see this call unfolding from two events in our text. The first event is in verses 13 and 14. We'll we'll call this the call demonstrated. The call demonstrated verses 13 and 14, and later we'll see in verses 15 to 17, the call defended. So first, the call demonstrated. Now, up to now, Jesus, if, if you're tracking through Mark, Jesus has been proclaiming himself as the king and demonstrating the priorities of his kingdom. So in verses 35 through 39 of chapter 1, he prioritized teaching over miracles. That although he did perform miracles, he healed people, he, he cast out demons to show that he was the king bringing the kingdom, yet he, he, he pulled away from that to teach, to preach, prioritizing that ministry. He said, that is why I came out. And then in verses 40 to 45, we see the kingdom priority of holiness over hype. That he, with a touch, could cleanse a leper and, and make him clean again, according to the Old Testament ceremonial laws. But then this kind of miracle-working power, of course, it, 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 it really gets a lot of attention, and there's all this hype that builds up, and people want to see him. And Jesus is actually trying to avoid these crowds. He's not interested in hype. He's interested in spreading holiness. And then in chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, we see Jesus prioritizing forgiveness over healing. And many of you are familiar with the account where the quadriplegic is lowered through a hole in the roof by his friends into this crowded room where Jesus is teaching. He sees this. He sees in this act their faith. And the first thing he thinks to say is, your sins are forgiven. And then he heals him to show that he had the authority to forgive sins. So Jesus is showing the priorities of the kingdom, healing, I'm sorry, teaching over miracles, holiness over hype, forgiveness over healing. So by this point in verse 13, the setting is pretty familiar. He's been spending his time in the region of Galilee. Here he is in verse 13, by the Sea of Galilee, where he has been canvassing the area teaching. It says in verse 13, he went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. So crowds teeming, as they've been, they they know there's a miracle worker. Some of them are seeking a miracle. Some of them probably just curious. I mean, this is the most interesting, amazing thing that they've ever seen in their time. So they're flocking to him. And Jesus, as we've come to expect by this point, in tension with their desires, probably for a show, he's teaching them. He's taking the opportunity to exercise that priority to teach them about his kingdom. So familiar setting in verse 13, but in verse 14, we see that Jesus is on a specific mission. 
it says, And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in a tax booth. So here we have Jesus surrounded by crowds. And it's interesting in the story. So the one man in the story who's not already following Jesus, he stops and sees him in a, in a tax booth and says, You, follow me. It's amazing. Jesus is probably in his young 30s. It is am- I'm in my young 30s. It is amazing for me to see how unimpressed Jesus is with the number of people around him. And he cares about them. He teaches them. But he has like laser-like focus on this one guy. He stops and says, I want you. Well, who is this guy that would make Jesus stop? Excuse me, stop and call him like that. It's Levi, the tax collector. He's also called Matthew elsewhere in the Gospels. And you may know if you've studied the Gospels or heard them preach that uh, the tax collectors are, are this group of people. They were contractors under the Roman government. So Rome was the empire in charge of this land, Galilee and Judea. And there was actually a puppet Jewish government, Herod's government, under them. And the tax collectors were these business people who paid a franchise fee to the government for the authority to collect as much as they could. Uh, They would soak their neighbors. They just paid their annual dues. It's probably quite a bit they would pay, and then they could just go out and get as much as they could. And they were very creative at finding ways to squeeze their neighbors. Uh, So can you imagine? I mean, he was there by the Sea of Galilee, probably with a booth there set up to tax fishermen the likes of Peter and Andrew and James and John that Jesus had already called. So imagine you're trying to scrape out a living for your family. People back then lived much more hand-to-mouth, subsistence living, and you're trying to get by, and there's this tax collector who has free reign to soak you. He's probably living more luxuriously than you, leeching your money. He's a collaborator with Caesar. He's financially corrupt, oppressing you and his other neighbors. These people were despised. They were hated. They were regarded, and rightly, as as totally wicked people. So this is Levi. And with Mark's typical brevity, he's so fast in the action. Jesus sees him and, and says, follow me, verse 14. And he rose and followed him. So this call of Jesus to Levi, what is Jesus saying? Is he saying, come and join my throng. Join this crowd of curious people and see what they're interested in. No, Levi knows that's not what he's saying. We know that because he leaves behind his business. He leaves behind the tax booth, closes it up. He he knows that what he's being challenged to do, what he's being called to do, is much more decisive than join a crowd of people flocking to Jesus. Maybe he had seen Jesus already on the Sea of Galilee calling Peter and Andrew and James and John, the fishermen, and seeing that when they followed Jesus, it was very decisive. They were following after him as their rabbi, falling in behind him. We don't know how much Levi knew at this point, but we know that he got it because when he heard the call, he said, yes, I'll follow Jesus. And he left the tax booth. So this is our demonstration of Jesus' call to a sinner, the vilest sort of sinner in this society, a corrupt, unjust oppressor of his neighbors. But what we'll see in the next three verses is that this is not just an isolated incident in the, in the life of Jesus. The way these two in, uh, incidents are put together shows us this is a ministry strategy by Jesus. There's actually a profound principle underlying why he did this. So let's look then at the call defended in verses 15 to 17. And these verses set a new scene for us. We're no longer out by the tax booth. But you'll see it's just so closely related. It may have been even that night or soon after Certainly, the topically, it just follows right after his call of Levi. So in verse 15, we have Jesus reclining at table in his house. That's probably Levi's house. And as that happens, there are many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. This motley crew of people, tax collectors and sinners. This, this latter group, sinners, is a term probably describing people who basically openly disregarded the law of God. They didn't make any attempt or, or they didn't really have any shame about just openly disobeying the law. They refused to keep the requirements of the law. And in a sense, we could kind of put a quote around the word sinners because this way of describing these people is a very pharisaical, like that's how they would have referred to these people. In fact, they do that in verse 16. And, and that's even indicative. We'll get into that in a moment. But notice the distinction that's implied there when you call a group of people sinners um, that would seem to preclude yourself as being a sinner. 
So this is sinners maybe with quotes, but Jesus does himself affirm that they are truly wicked people. They're truly bad folks because he, he compares them with the, the sick, the spiritually sick with his metaphor in verse 17. So we could just think of these as bad characters. These are evidently bad people, people that were known by all as bad folks. Why are they here? Verse 15 tells us, for there were many who followed him. Many such people following Jesus. Maybe Levi had roped in his old friends. We don't know exactly how that came to be. Or maybe Jesus had been out calling others like Levi, other tax collectors and sinners. But there were many now following him. And this leads us to a conflict in verse 16 that arises. And, and this, in verse 16, it says, And the, scribe of the, Phar- the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners. And this is a very understandable conflict if we understand a few background facts. The first is this, this group of characters, the Pharisees. Now, we've seen, now they're called the scribes of the Pharisees. We've seen the scribes before in Mark. They're, they appear ch- in chapter 2, verse 6, already becoming critical of Jesus, questioning what he did as he forgave sin. They were the legal scholars of the law of Moses. And the Pharisees, so these are the scribes of the Pharisees. They were of the Pharisee sect. And that is a group uh, of uh, Jews in Israel in, in those days, and they were, their name Pharisee in, indicates separation. So they were like a separatist holy group. They regarded themselves as those who were set aside, set apart from the rest of sinful society in order to be zealous for the law of God. In fact, they would try to exceed the law. They would set up laws, rules around the law to keep them from breaking the law. So they would like add to the law, build on it. They were in their eyes, just so holy and zealous about keeping God's law. The second fact we need to understand for this conflict is what does table fellowship mean in their culture? To sit at table and dine with somebody. Even in our culture, this does convey a sense of of approval and a sense of fellowship, but you can ratchet that up times 10 in Jesus' culture that uh, one author says it indicates personal acceptance and cordiality. And we see this elsewhere in Scripture, that there's tension, right? You, you may recall Peter eating with the Gentiles in Acts 11 and in Galatians 2. This is a big deal. Uh, when Peter withdraws from eating with Gentiles and he's undermining the gospel, this has massive implications. It's a very morally significant choice to, to, to eat with somebody. And so they see Jesus evidently giving a measure of approval, personal approval and acceptance to these awful people, these evidently, obviously bad folks. Thirdly, we need to understand a little bit more about who Jesus has been claiming to be. As we heard in in verses 14 and 15 of chapter 1, that he's proclaiming the kingdom. He's proclaiming himself as the king. And if there's anything that's clear about the kingdom of God in the Old Testament, it is that God's righteousness will be enforced in his kingdom. It is a place of God's righteousness being enforced. This brings us back to that passage from Isaiah 33, where he talks about seeing the king in his beauty. This is a passage about the coming of the king, that the sinners in Zion are afraid. Trembling has seized the godless. Who among us can dwell with a consuming fire? This is the scene of when the king comes. So there, there are other prophecies. Isaiah 11.4, also a clear messianic prophecy about the, the shoot from the stump of Jesse prophesying about Jesus, saying, With righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. See that judging the poor and deciding with equity? He's looking out for the financially oppressed. That's part of his righteous rule as king. So before we jump to scoffing at the Pharisees, we need to actually understand the biblical tension here. That even though they ask in proud unbelief, they do raise a good point about what it means for Jesus to be the king. Sometimes when we read the Old Testament prophets, if you have a Bible reading plan, you're in multiple places, you're reading the Old Testament prophets, and you hear these thunderous proclamations against the wicked in the land, the the, the financial oppressors that abuse their neighbors, like we just read, and, and we can root for God against the wicked. We can root for God to bring his justice when it's promised. And then we turn to the Gospels, and we see Jesus interacting with the tax collectors and sinners, and we're rooting for the tax collectors and sinners. These are the same people. These are the exact kind of people that that 
caused Israel to get exiled from the land. This disregard of the law of God, they broke their covenant with God. So can we at least sympathize with the question? Now again, they ask in unbelief, okay, son of David, what are you doing with these sinners? Eating with these sinners? Table fellowship with the wicked. Actually, they don't even ask him in verse 16. They ask the disciples. Maybe they, they want to shake the disciples' confidence in, in the master they're following and still learning about. Maybe they want to, do you really think this, he's proclaiming the kingdom of God is at hand? Look at him. He's eating with sinners. When's he going to clear them out? Now, Jesus overhears a question on such a weighty matter, he does not leave it to his fledgling disciples to speculate and answer. He's like, I'm, I'm going to answer this. So in verse 17, when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. It's an amazing reply. First, it starts with a metaphor. He's appealing to their reason. And, and in this metaphor, he casts himself as the picture of a doctor. And he's saying, what kind of a doctor exclusively stays with healthy people all day? Can you imagine a doctor who's, you know, is, you're like making appointments at the, the doctor's office, and they say, you know, only healthy people. If you, have any, if you have any medical issues, don't come. We don't want the doctor to get sick. You can only come if you're healthy, right? Be a terrible doctor. They see people because they have problems. That's what qualifies you to go to the doctor. You have an issue. So he casts himself as a doctor in this picture. And then in the, the, after that metaphor, he gives the principle itself. Now this is why when he was on the Sea of Galilee, surrounded by a crowd, he sees Levi. This is why he stopped when he saw that man. This is why he's in this house with these wicked people. It's this statement. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Stop and think about this, what he's saying. A doctor? We were expecting a judge, an executioner, a doctor? A doctor's job is very different than a judge's job, right? Can you imagine getting a death sentence at the doctor's office? A doctor get, uh, examines you, gives you diagnosis, and then the doctor's job is to try to fix the problem. A doctor is very different than a judge. Doctors do not issue rulings. By calling himself a doctor, Jesus is revealing an era of his kingdom preceding its fullness. This is important to understand. An era of his kingdom perceiving its full coming. Isaiah was not wrong. God did not change his mind. Jesus is not undermining any word, any jot or tittle of the Old Testament scriptures. Revelation 19 talks about what it will be like when Jesus comes the second time again. Lest there be any confusion. He is, the picture is that his eyes are like a flame of fire. On his head are many diadems, crowns. He's clothed in a robe dipped with blood. It goes on. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. This is the same picture that Isaiah gives. It is an awesome, terrifying thing. But that is the future. That is the future. First, he came for a season of mercy. First, he came for a time of mercy. The hammer of God's justice has not gone away. It's suspended in the air for a time, waiting as Jesus gathers followers who will come and follow him as king. All the wicked who will come before the hammer comes down, and it will come down. Another major implication of what he's saying is to the Pharisees, I did not come for you. Isn't that amazing? I did not come for you. Why not them? They're the ones, right, in Isaiah 33, we're the ones who can dwell in Zion. We're the ones without any, who, who hate unjust gain. We're the ones without any wickedness in our speech. No, I came to call the sinners in mercy. I came to call sinners in mercy. Yes, it's like, it's like he could say, yes, I'm the Davidic king, yes. But I didn't come to affirm your proud self-righteousness. I did not come to join you in condemning these people. I came to open a door of mercy to them. As for you and your righteousness, I'm not here for you. That's what he's saying. I didn't come to call the right. I'm not here for you. It's like he said almost sarcastically, you guys are fine. Aren't you already righteous? You'll be fine. 
When, God, when, when judgment comes, when the justice of God comes, you'll be fine. It's like they're, they're on this raft and they're setting out across the Pacific Ocean and it's like, I'm sure that's seaworthy. Go ahead, you'll be fine when the justice of God comes. Cling to your righteousness and see where it gets you, righteous people, when God comes with a consuming fire. You see, the problem is the Pharisees should have believed their whole Old Testament, not just the parts that they could interpret and twist to affirm them. They should have believed Psalm 14, verses 2 and 3. Yahweh looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. What does he find? They have all turned aside. Together, they have become corrupt. Oh, surely he means in general, all kinds of people? No, he goes on. There is none who does good, not even one. There are many outwardly righteous people who can put on a shell of goodness But God's all-seeing eye pierces through that exterior to the heart motivations, the heart treasures. He's looking for those who seek after God, who obey the first and greatest commandment to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And when he looks at that level, it's bleak. He's like, none of them, not a single one of them. Everyone at that level of heart motivations and desires has preferred substitutes over God, even the squeaky cleanest Pharisee in that room with Jesus. So King Jesus came to call into his kingdom self-acknowledged sinners, not the self-made righteous. Now there are a number of implications that we could look at it, and time would fail to talk about all the implications of this reality, but we could, we could summarize a few under the headings, of the four headings. The first is The first implication is welcome. Welcome. If you know you're a bad person, Jesus came for you. Jesus came for you. And I don't mean, if you know you're a bad person, Jesus came even for you. Because he said, I didn't come to call the righteous. And there he means the self-righteous. I came only to call people who know they're sinners. He came specifically for the likes of you. If you know you are a sinner, you know that when God looks with that all-seeing, all-knowing eye into your soul, he sees, do you seek after God? He knows. You know that he knows that you don't. That's a good place to be if you know that's you. Without lowering his perfect standard, Jesus died in our place to secure God's forgiveness and to grant us a gift of his righteousness so that we can stand in the judgment. So if you know you're a bad person, Jesus came to be with you, but beware, he did not come to be like you. He did not come to be like you. You, like Levi, must leave your tax booth. You are being faced with choice. If you know you're a sinner, there is a call. He's giving Levi this call, and there are many sinners and tax collectors, verse 15, following Jesus. They knew the call. It was a drastic call choice. It was a drastic uh, uh, crossroads before them. You must commit your life to his rule. You must leave the tax booth behind. He didn't come to mix with sinners to be like them. He came radically to call them away from sin to him. He has opened a door of mercy for you. If you know you're a sinner, he has opened a door of mercy, and it's open for now. It's open for a time. But I urge you with the greatest urgency, run in faith to him now. Do not wait. We do not know how long this door is open. We know it will close. We know it will close forever one day. When he comes again, he will have a sword in his mouth. He will have a robe dipped in blood. All who did not trust him will be consumed in his just wrath. But when he comes again, he'll spread a table for his people for those who did follow him in faith, for all those wicked tax collectors and sinners, there'll be a feast forever enjoying his presence. The second implication after welcome is warning. There's a warning here that there is no place at Jesus' table for the self-righteous, for self-made righteous people. Self-righteousness, we see it here in the Pharisees, but it knows no bounds of religion or culture or time. It is an age-old and very common heart disease that can creep in unnoticed 
and slip in and destroy you. Whatever your profession, whether you claim to follow Christ or not, on the authority of this passage, there is nothing that will more surely bar you from the kingdom of God than relying on your own goodness. There is nothing that will more surely bar you from the kingdom of God than relying on your own goodness before him. When you trust your own righteousness, first of all, you're destroying any sense of assurance you could have of the love of God in Christ. You're, you're, it's all going to be based on how well am I doing now? If you're trusting your own righteousness, have I been good enough? Does he love me? If you trust your own righteousness, you foster a heart of pride and self-reliance. And then you look with contempt on the very people Jesus is calling. You look with contempt and say, them? You turn away from Christ's welcome, his glorious, merciful welcome. You turn yourself away from it to rely on your own works before God in the judgment. Nothing is more dangerous than relying on your own goodness. So I urge you, let's watch our hearts closely. Watch against the encroachment, the creeping of disdain against the people Jesus is calling. They can be messy folks. When sinners are coming to Jesus, it can be messy. But if we start seeing in our hearts disdain toward them, see that as a warning. We need to be aware. The dangerous encroachment of that heart hardness of self-righteousness. So there is welcome, there is warning. Thirdly, there's work. Jesus, in a, a few places, after his resurrection, commissioned his disciples that essentially their mission would be an extension of his own mission. He says in John 20, 21, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. In Matthew 28, 19 to 20, he tells them to He tells his disciples to make disciples, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. So to be a disciple of Jesus is to be a disciple maker. It is to be one who's commissioned, as Jesus uh, himself was commissioned, to, to, to call others and teach them how to follow him. That is every disciple's task. So in light of that, I ask you, Christian, do you spend time with evidently sinful people? How are we doing with that? Spending time with the obviously sinful people. If not, why not? There are a few reasons potentially. One is, we might, we might be thinking rightly, we're thinking, well, we're called to holy separation from the world. Uh, 2 Corinthians 6, what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them. There is a very clear New Testament call and a teaching for believers to be very distinct from the world. And there's no true fellowship we have, no true partnership with the world. Yet doesn't today's passage provide something of a helpful tension there? To hold in tension that there is a radical separateness and otherness? But as Jesus, if we are to be meaningfully in the world, we need to rub elbows with messy, sinful people. Because we've been called to call them as disciples. Jesus spent time with messy, sinful people. A second reason why we may not spend time with evidently sinful people is if if you're a Christian, and honestly, this might be one of the strongest reasons why, sinners are uncomfortable. Sinners are uncomfortable. Really bad people are uncomfortable. And in a way, that's a good thing, Christian. If you're used to Christian company, you're used to the refreshment of fellowship with brothers and sisters. There's something unique and, and refreshing and glorious about that. It's a good thing. That's called holiness. But think of Jesus. Is Jesus, was Jesus, is Jesus any less holy than you or I? Far holier. Do you think he was uncomfortable in the presence of sin? There's a, a discomfort in the presence of sinners that he had to face. Do you think he liked the kinds of messiness of sin that, that would fill that room? I'm sure he was very uncomfortable, way less comfortable than we can be. But it was mercy and the knowledge of his mission that he was there to call sinners that drove him over that barrier. And I urge you, brothers and sisters, let's let that mercy that we've received from God drive us over those barriers. But I ask you also, if you spend time with sinners, what are you using that time to do? Are we using that time to ape them, to be comfortable and to be like them, to be liked by them? Jesus wasn't there for that. He was very much with them, but he was very much not like them. What was he doing with them? He was calling them to follow him. He was calling folks like Levi to leave the tax booth and follow him. We are to prophetically call them radically away from sin to follow the Savior. 
So I would just urge each of you to, to know your tendency maybe of your heart between these two. Maybe there is uh, an over-isolation of yourself from the world where you, you do not spend time with very many non-believers. You do not spend uh, time with sinful people. Or maybe you do spend time with those folks, but you're not very different than them. And there's not kind of a holy savor of Christ in your life that they can see in your words and your deeds. Each of us ought to search our hearts before God and know what might be a tendency or maybe both at times. So there is welcome, there is warning, there is work, and finally, there is worship. There is worship in this passage. The bottom line of all this, in the words of Isaiah, we start to see the king in his beauty, don't we? We see the king in his beauty, which makes Jesus appear more glorious to affirm already good people or to welcome and doctor the souls of wicked people, which exalts his all-sufficiency and his love and his power more effectively. The way he came to save sinners is so glorious to him. We can see and adore. I love that we read from Proverbs, and we, in our prayer, we exalted Christ for his wisdom. I love the wisdom of Christ in this passage. In in the Greek, it's 16 little words in, in verse 17. He does so much. He lays bare his opponent's pride. He cuts straight to the heart of their objection. He clarifies his identity, and he shows forth the beauty of his, his mission of mercy. Just the perfect words to cut right through. He's so wise. All through the gospel, so wisely handling every situation. We can see and adore here Christ's spotless holiness on the one hand, Never any sin in his thoughts, words, or deeds, yet mixing graciously, condescending to mix with very messy people. His holiness, his holiness, and yet his willingness to mix with sinners. Jonathan Edwards calls this the, 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 the conjunction of his divine excellencies. There's, there's extra glory when you put these kinds of glories together. Similarly with what we can see and adore here, his mixture of wrathful justice on one hand and patient mercy on the other. That without putting aside any word from the Old Testament scriptures, without lowering the bar of God's justice, without ceasing to care about injustice and the oppressed, without failing to keep one word first in mercy, he came to call. Let's pray. Father, we adore the Lord Jesus in this passage. You give us so much to treasure and love and be in awe of. Your judgment, your justice, the coming fullness of the kingdom is a terrifying reality, but it is glorious. But we who are wicked before you, we who have nothing to stand on, We look and see the beautiful mercy of Jesus and we thank you. For everyone in this room who has fled for Christ to refuge, we thank you. We pray you would refresh in our hearts the gratitude, the joy, the awe that you deserve. And we pray that if anyone in this room does not know know Christ yet, that there would be the right fear and trembling and the right beckoning by this picture of Jesus' mercy that they would respond tonight in faith. We pray all this for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.